Well, hello there. Notice the sun is out. At long last, the temperature has gone up into the 60s. Oh, God, I didn't think it would ever happen. I should be working on the Thunderbird today with the temperature the way it is, you know, getting the seal out of that rear end that I've got sitting on the table over there. Unfortunately, I can't. I can't. It's, the temperature's going to go down into the 40s, uh, starting again tomorrow, the middle 40s. It'll hover around there for another week or so. I've got to try an experiment. I have a stump I need to get rid of in the yard. Actually, I've got five of them. And we're going to try an experiment on one. If it works on one, I'll use the same method to get rid of the tree stumps on the remaining four. If not, well, then I'll just abandon the whole thing and we'll go back to working on the Thunderbird. <laughs> the, uh, you know, our local stump removers, they want $75 to $100 per stump, you know, to come in here and go zip, zip, zip back and forth. Forget all that. I am not paying some guy $75 bucks to 100 bucks to get rid of a stupid stump. Uh, it'll stay in the yard before I'll pay that kind of money. I can use that money for other things. So we'll go ahead and go over there and I'll let you see what we got set up. This is, a, this is nothing I invented. I saw this on YouTube. I thought it was a great idea and that's why I'm giving it a shot. So let, let's take a look at what it's going to take. Here's our first victim. It's a double stump. I cut down uh, the tree several years ago and just never worried about it after that. One is beginning to rot away. This one here is still pretty solid, pretty hard. It's going to take a few more years. <laughs> Not if I can help it. What I saw on YouTube was a fellow that had a barrel and he had both ends cut out, which is exactly what I have right here. He put the barrel over the top of the stump and then he put charcoal in the bottom and then he started a fire and kept feeding it with wood and it eventually burned the stump right away because the fire stayed confined inside the barrel. Well, if he could do it, so can I. So let's see what happens. Well, the old barrel wouldn't quite fit over both stumps. It was just shy, about two, three inches. I just took the old sledgehammer and beat that other one out. Came out no problem at all. This is what's left of that. I'll go ahead and use that inside the barrel to burn that one out. That'll all be cooked away. Let's get the barrel up here. Well, she's about centered in there, best I can get it without having it, you know, tilted left or right. You need to have a fire all the way around it. At least that's just the way I understand it. Let's get the charcoal in. Well, there it is. I decided to dump the whole bag in. That's a 16 pound bag. Eh, what the heck. Let's get the fire going and wash her fry. I'm going to throw anything in there, it'll burn. Over here is uh, our wood pile, uh, the tree limbs and everything I burned down. I had a lot of leftover chunks because the rain put the fire out. So all that stuff's going to be picked up, put in the wheelbarrow, and it's going in the old barrel too. Uh, anything that'll burn. Well, we're making good headway. We got a nice hot fire going down there. Uh, well, I'll just let it burn for a while. It's time for me to go inside and get a Pepsi. Well, this is the first of our radios that I've gotten repaired that I showed you in the last video. This is the Zenith A615M. M, I mean W. A615W. And uh, the W stands for white. So this thing was dead in the water when I got it. The needle the string was broken. The dial string was broken and everything. I've aligned it. It just doesn't want to align up the way it should. The only light it has is an on. -off. This is an indicator light to show you the radio's on. That's it. It's from around 1957. That's what the uh, photofac is dated. With the help of Brendan, he got me the photofac. I could. I was having trouble finding it. Anyway, uh, it it won't align the way I want it to align. But it's now functional. I got everything working. It had once I got some noise out of this thing it was. You know, the, the electrolytics were in terrible condition. A couple of the uh, paper caps were really bad off. But we we got her back in plan. The problem is I'm about 100 kilocycles off on the uh, on the dial. It, it sounds great. It's got a 6 by 9 inch speaker. It's great, great big speaker here in the front. It also has a tone control over here on the side. Works good, huh? Anyway, that's 6.50 a.m. I, I tried everything to get that thing back. It just doesn't want to go. I don't know if there's something wrong with the oscillator coil. 
I'm not going to worry about it. If it's off, it's off. That's, you know, let the next guy worry about it. The whole idea was to get these radios functional and repaired. And, uh, you know, if they don't want to align, I'm not going to argue with them. I've done everything I can with it. Time to move on. Our next one's going to be a, an AF, AM FM. This is a, uh, what is that stupid thing? I don't even know what it is. This is a, uh, another Zenith. Oh. Another Zenith. I've, I've repaired one of those before. They, they they have terrific sound. Terrific. But boy, I'll tell you what. They can be a bear on the FM side. Way back Wednesday on WSN. This is a great radio. I really like it. Now this little Zenith right here. Uh, I did a little work on the inside of it in the past. But when I got done, it never was quite right. I mean, it worked okay, played okay, but it just wasn't quite right. So I sort of set it up and forgot about it and until now. Let's turn it around. Someone wrote on the back here, I didn't do it, someone else did. It says, uh, Tube AM FM, and the year is 1962, and it is a Model H. 723C and then there's another number underneath 7H04 which might be the chassis number and it is a Zenith. Now this this uh, is your power cord right here. It's under the underneath the radio if I can get it out from under. Come here you. Alright, here's the power cord. It comes up and it hooks right here on this metal thing on the back of the radio and what that is is that's your antenna connection. There's a wire on the other side of his thing that goes into the radio. They used the power cord as the antenna. Pretty neat, huh? If you look in there, you see no antenna. Let me get this thing out of there. Yeah, I'll have to unsolder it, unscrew it or something. But anyway, there is no antenna in there, okay? Well, let's take a look at what I've done to this radio in the past. I don't even remember doing it, really. It looks like I changed one, two, three capacitors. I left the selenium rectifier in it. I changed another capacitor on top, somewhere in this area here. All the rest is just stock. So I think what I'm going to do is go ahead and clean the tube pins, spray everything out, clean it up, and I don't know, maybe I'll put a a diode here in place of the selenium maybe not you know like I said a lot of these radios are going to be given away I just want to be able to give them away uh, in a functional status okay this would be your FM side of the house I believe all this shielded stuff here this is all your your standard uh, uh, you know uh, RF section and whatnot but this is this is where the rubber meets the road on fine-tuning you get this messed up it takes forever to get it back in Let's turn it over. Well, it looks like I left the electrolytic in. I don't know what that hard crap is. I don't know what it is. Looks like it might be mud. It might be strangest thing. I don't know. And I did, in fact, change the capacitor on the antenna coming in off the antenna. That's about it. And uh, I guess it's time to do a little cleanup. I'll tell you what. Before we do that, let's just plug it in and see if it works. All right, FM is up. The switch down is AM. Let's try the FM first. It's not a good idea to uh, turn a knob using your hand on a bare switch like that. Always put the knob on. Well, we're getting noise. Always put the knob on. But anyway, this radio has one of these deals where the knobs don't come off unless you take keepers off the rear. Kind of neat, you can't lose your knobs that way. And then same thing with the tuner dial. They have these uh, metal clips on the rear that hold them in place to keep them from coming out. See that two tab clip down there at the bottom? Good idea, but you gotta be aware, you know, you, this, this one here will not come off. I mean, you just sit there and pull and pull and pull and pull and wind up breaking the shaft trying to get it off, you know. Some radios are like that, keep that in mind. Let's see what we got here. This is FM. Oh, we're getting sound. How about that? Find a different station besides that one. In Vietnam. Forward slash Fayetteville. AFA.net forward slash 
Fayetteville mm -hmm. in order to register and right. find out more information. All right. It also has a fairly large speaker on it. Well, that sounds pretty good. Let's try AM. See if we get anything on AM. Not much usually around here on AM. Probably have to turn up the voice. Most of the stations are weak. Not much at all on AM. Like I said, you have to turn the radio. It's got another loop antenna. Oh, there we go. different cats and if you want to change out different okay I think what we can do it looks like it's going to be okay I'll just go ahead and clean it back up again and, and run with it our whirlpool dishwasher crapped out on us the other day I dropped a knife or I didn't put a knife in the uh, in the uh, you know the utensil the uh, tray and it fell out and a uh, holder and it fell out and it melted the plastic handle on the element, well, no problem. I took the element out. It, it just wouldn't heat up. It wouldn't dry the dishes. So I took the element out, ohmed it out. Sure enough, it's open. I went downtown, bought another one. They ordered it. It came in the next day. 50 bucks, you know, brought it home. And still, I mean, it worked and everything. Ohmed it out. And I ohmed it out a second time after it got put in. And the element's still good, but still, I'm not getting the heat action. It won't heat up at the end of the washing to dry the dishes. So I said, well, maybe it's the thermostat. So I took the thermostat out. It's a little round thing about this big. Took it out, hooked it to my multimeter, and then put it over the stove burner. And it, you know, the multimeter and it closed. And then I put it underneath the cold water and it opened back up. And I got continuity, no continuity. So the thermostat was working. The only problem was I didn't know what temperature it was actually opening and closing at. So I went ahead and called the people up that I got the... Uh, the, you know the heating element from I said give me another one of those thermostats you know only 19 bucks and the dishwasher has been around a while so it was probably time for a new one anyway meanwhile I decided you know they're gonna they ordered it it won't be until tomorrow meanwhile I decided well let's go on YouTube and figure out how to get the control panel loose from the front of that door and I'll spray the contacts and everything and I'll check it out look it over make sure there's no you know blown capacitors or whatever like you would a normal antique radio repair fix or something like that. So I went on YouTube and this is what the guy says. You know, it's a Whirlpool and they're pretty much all the same. Our exact model's not there, but he said, all you have, this is all you have to do in order to get the uh, panel off is you take out two screws here, two there, and two on the other side, raise the door up, and then, you know, notice how the panel just lifts right on out. Nothing to it. There's your control panel right there. Right there it is. Yeah, right. Look what I had to do. I had to remove the entire outer door, pull the cover off to get to the control panel here, and that was a big pain in the butt. I'll tell you what, this is not going to be fun, but I'm going to continue on. I have to release it on the top, I think, and slide it to the left. The whole panel will come out, and then I can release this plastic on the bottom. It rotates down. And then I can continue spraying. I sprayed a few of the contacts already. And uh, this is the cover that goes on it right here. The cover had to be removed. Oh, what a mess it turned out to be. This wire had to be removed, which goes from the uh, push-button control panel. Come on, camera focus. It has to go from the push-button control panel here to the, uh, uh, on the door rather, to the control panel there, the push buttons. This is the cable between them. Anyway, I'm kind of hoping when I get that thermostat in tomorrow, that'll solve the whole problem. Meanwhile, I'm going to, like I said, spray it on down with contact cleaner, do the best I can, put it all back together and see what happens. Uh, the control panel, uh, if need be, and I need a new control panel, it's going to run uh, 88 bucks. You know, but that's okay. That's a whole lot cheaper than paying $360, $390, $400 for a new dishwasher. Well, there's the control panel all unplugged. I don't see anything wrong with it. That's kind of a squirrely looking thing right there in the center between those two electrolytic capacitors right there. 
little dark on top. That's a coil. It's L2, they call it. And I don't have a schematic on this thing. But this, if I buy the control board, this is what I'll get. It'll come out in one piece. All I have to do is plug it together. I'll tell you what, they made this overly complicated to get apart. This was really stupid. Anyway, but it does slide to the left. you got to slide it to the left. There's a uh, release right here. See that little catch right there? This little metal tab keeps it from sliding to the left, so you have to push that down. And then when you take a screwdriver and lift this up right here, I can get the screwdriver underneath it. Come on now. There we go. If you get the screwdriver underneath it, you can lift it up like that, and it releases... It releases uh, one of the grooves, that groove right there that comes out of that groove. Then you slide the whole thing to the left. Anyway, uh, I'm going to go out and spray it, give it a good shot, and I'll put it all back together. And then um, they set around noontime tomorrow, they'll have that thermostat in. Hopefully that'll solve the problem. If not, this was a good trial run on how to, you know, remove the control panel. Well, that's it for now. I've got everything put back together. Uh, tomorrow, I'll just, and when the, after I get the thermostat, I'll stick it in. It goes up underneath the bottom here. One little screw and the whole thing comes out. Unplug two wires. Piece of cake there. And uh, I'll, I'll just lean the door against it here tomorrow and plug it up. And then use the buttons on the front panel and see if I can't do a load of dishes or do something. And then when it gets through the drying cycle, we'll pop the door open. And hopefully we'll see a lot of steam come out because we have seen nothing and the dishes have been wet. So if that part is not working. And I'm, I'm almost positive it's going to wind up being that thermostat. But at least I now know how to take all that apart if I have to do it again, which I will if need be. Well, at long last, folks, we have a new addition to our garage, a 20-gallon air compressor. The old 8-gallon just wasn't hacking the program for the operation of my air tools that I bought. And uh, this is good for, you know, running around and putting air in the tires on the car and blowing out maybe the, the computer towers, you know, stuff like blowing out the inside of radio cabinets, things like that. You know, general purpose, low pressure stuff, although it will go up to 130 PS, 135 PSI is the maximum on that. It's got a one and a half horsepower motor. This one's got a one, no, one horsepower motor. This one's got a 1.3 horsepower with a maximum pressure rating of 150 PSI. But I don't need anywhere near that kind of pressure. You know, all the tools I bought, 90 PSI is what it takes maximum. They'll work fine. But I am going to hook the two together. We're going to hook the two together. I bought a 20-foot uh, hose that will come out of this one here to operate the tools. Because once I get them hooked together, I'm not going to be able to kind of move them around, uh, you know, all the time. Uh, I'm going to have quick disconnect fittings, of course, that I can disconnect a small one and, you know, run around and put air in the tires and wheel it out to the carport and stuff. This one will pretty much stay in the in the garage here, but we're going to put a bunch of quick disconnect fittings in and, you know, we'll show you how all that's done later. There'll be a shutoff valve in between them, so I don't want any air to leak out of this tank. There'll probably be a re another <clears throat> 135 maximum on this, 150 on this. You know, we'll run it at around 100, maybe 110 maximum. Now, unless I find out I got to go a little higher, I just don't want to run over the maximum pressure for that. So we'll put it, I'll look around for a pressure relief valve that we'll put in there. It's already got one on the side over there, but I might want to put a second one in between the two just to, for safety purposes, okay? So that's what's coming up on that. You'll, we'll show you how to hook these two together. I've gone on uh, YouTube and watched guys hook them together, hook auxiliary tanks together with an existing uh, air compressor. And I'm going to tell you, they do a lousy job of explaining it. <laughs> it drives me crazy. You know, you'd think they'd rehearse it a little bit, come up with, you know, shorten it down and get it to the point and show close-ups and things of what you're doing and explain it and hook it up you know, that way so people understood what was happening. Some people understood it. I don't think the majority did. <laughs> you have to watch this, watch the videos four or five times to figure out what they're saying. Anyway, I'm going to try to avoid all that and do it, you know, clarify it. And there's some of you have some suggestions along the way. I've already discussed all this with Brendan. I'm sure we've, we've got it pretty much nailed down. Well, it looks like we're stuck with a broken dishwasher until at least... Monday the part that I ordered was this little thermostat that goes on the bottom of the uh, 
dishwasher, two wires plugged into it. But she wound up ordering me the entire control panel. We had talked about the control panel. I told her if this doesn't fix the problem, uh, I'll come back and have to order the control panel. She looked up the numbers for both and wound up ordering the wrong number. <laughs> it was just a mistake, you know. She apologized. I said, don't worry about it. I'm not going anywhere anyway. She said, it'll be here Monday for sure. So you'll find out in the next Mishmash video whether or not this thing is functional or there's a new one in there, one of the two. MWSM, Nashville, Tennessee. And we're live from the Grand Ole Opry House in Nashville, Tennessee. Friday Night Opry. <laughs> there we go. I'm going to go ahead and call this radio done. We're going to, and uh, the FM works really great now. Everything, no, whatever static you're hearing and hum is coming from inside the house. I'll turn the dial just to prove it. See how it goes away. It's all in the all in the signal. All right. Randall Opry star John Conley, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Eddie. Hello, everybody. I wake up in the morning in the state of fright. On the wrong side of the bed all night. Take it to the broken John Conley. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's uh, we since we'll call this one done. Let's get another one out and see what it has to offer. Maybe we can get a triumvirate done here on this video. All right, this one is a silver tone. I like silver tone radios and I like airline radios. I think they're the two best radios ever made. Now, everybody says the Zenith this, you know, and not me. The RCA that, Philco, you know, no. Silver tone and airline, in my mind, I don't care if it's Tombstone or Bakelite radio or plastic radio, they always seem to be the best radios of all. And I don't know why. They're easy to work on. Anyway, uh, I'm, I think I might have done a little repair on this. I'm not sure. I might have restored it. I just can't remember. I've had so many radios I worked on over the years, it's hard to remember. It's fairly clean and looking real good, so I don't know. Chances are I did. So let's see what happens. Let's see if even the light lights up. Oh, yeah, it does. Check that out. Let me shut off the light here. As the tubes come on, the filaments come on, the light gets brighter. You know, it, it dims out at first, <clears throat> and then it gets brighter. Helps protect against the surge. Let's see what we got here. Ooh, not too bad. Let's see if we can get uh, 6.50 a.m. Well, this was not doing so good in the tuning department. And, of course, I have my little buddy here. Hey, baby. <laughs> he's got to sit in my lap. No matter what I do, he's got to be close to me. I'm going to turn this baby around here. Well, we're only pulling into strong stations. I can't even get 6.50 a.m. I don't know why. By the way, this is uh, what, what's called the uh, Silvertone Catalog Number no. 5 radio. Years ago, they, they identified the model of the radio by the number that it had in the uh, Sears catalog. This is Silvertone, sold by Sears Roebuck, or sold by Sears. Years ago, it was Sears Roebuck. That's what it was when I grew up with it. The Sears catalog, and the uh, Sears Roebuck catalog, and the Montgomery Ward catalog. <laughs> I'll tell you why I remember those as a kid. Well, it looks like I did do some work to this thing. All new capacitors to include electrolytics. Put a terminal strip in there to hold the electrolytics. A few new resistors. And uh, I guess maybe I just didn't tweak it quite enough. Well, the old third time is not a charm. I can't seem to tune in anything in the lower part of the band. <clears throat> unless it's a very powerful station. So I'm going to have to work on this, I guess. Anyway, that's about it for now. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this one up. Hopefully the next time the weather will be nice enough we can go you know, back to work on the Thunderbird. I just don't want to go out there when it's that cold. <clears throat> you know, our good buddy, uh, old R. Lee Ermey, you know, he passed away here not long ago. And guess what he died of? Pneumonia. 
uh, of all things, pneumonia in this day and age, when they have all kinds of medications and everything to help take care of that. Anyway, until next time, hope you enjoyed it. This is John. I'll tell you what, before we close out, let's go ahead and check our burn barrel here where I burned all that wood. Yeah, she burned down quite a ways. Got all that wood that was left over from the rain that put all that, I mean, when it put out the fire, got it all taken care of, burned for two days. Let's see if she's still warm. Yeah, she's still warm down there. I'm not gonna tip it over yet. Yeah, I'll let you know in the next mishmash video if the stump is gone or not.